So do residents get paid extra? How to use Anki better? As well as many other questions for your medical school journey, all in this episode, let's get into it. All right guys, what's going on? Welcome to the MD journey. Today I'm gonna to be doing something very fun, which is just kind of getting into a Q and A video by going through all the YouTube comments that I haven't been able to answer. Apologies for that, I've been on an IC rotation recently, but I do wanna make sure that I've been interactive with you guys and just kind of answer some of the questions that you guys have. So I'm gonna be able to pull up some of the comments that I haven't responded to yet. And hopefully if you have that comment, or if you have that question, as this will be a little helpful. And as always, I definitely recommend you guys drop your comments even to this video um, or to this episode. You know, I definitely read and look at every comment. Even if I'm not able to get to them immediately, I do try to answer them at some point. So definitely drop down any burning and non-burning questions that you may have down below. That includes things from med school, residency, studying, pre-med, you name it. Well, let's get into the questions today. We have Amir who's talking about, do residents get paid extra for 24 hour call nights and shifts? Now this is a video that will be coming out pretty shortly. I'll talk about kind of like what it's like as different things as a physician. Um, and one of the things that I definitely will make a video about is what it's like working an overnight call. Uh, one of the things I do as a second year resident is I actually work 28 hours straight. Um, on some shifts in the ICU and the wards um, as a medical professional. Um, and unfortunately, no, I don't get paid extra uh, for these 24 hour calls. At least my institution doesn't uh, pay us. It's just kind of something that's included in our salary and is expected as a job description. Um, but that would be nice. You know, maybe it wouldn't be so bad of working pretty much a full day and a half uh, with often no sleep at all. So next question is from Abid, who is always interacting in my YouTube channel. So Abid, thank you so much for your support. Um, basically the question is, he is doing science questions or science courses and from his lecture slides, he's creating about 120 oh, slides and he's trying to use the screenshot Anki method. If you guys don't know what that is, you guys can check that down below. Um, he's referring to some of the things that uh, I've been teaching in the Level Up Your Studying course as well, which I'll also link down below. Uh, but basically um, has 120 slides and he's asking, is that too much? Specifically, what would you advise to use Anki early in the morning before lecture or during the evening? Now, if you have any classes, um, this question applies to basically anyone that says, is my material too much and how should I approach it? Um, often what I like to do is if I get some benefit from looking at the material quicker um, earlier than I do it, but I only do it in a set amount of time. So what I mean by that is if you have a lecture like Abid um, has here with 120 slides, um, it's really not time and kind of conducive to go through those 120 slides very systematically and then go to the lecture and hear it again. And then at some point have to review them. That's just too much time. So either I skim through them very early or create my skin, uh, screenshot Anki methods, uh, which which again, you guys can check out down below. But I try to do it as quickly as possible. And sometimes I completely skip out on this pre-reading kind of uh, acquisition phase and I just go to lecture or I listen to it and then I take my notes on the slides or on my flashcards, whichever I do. Uh, but if you do have any class material that's become pretty excessive, then I definitely recommend to, you know, just wait till that acquisition phase comes and minimize how much and how often you do it. Um, so just try to do it once or twice and that includes just going to lecture looking at your slides and making your screenshots potentially a little bit before lecture and that way you can answer and add questions and things that the professor mentions um, as kind of your notes and hopefully that can save you some time while you're doing these really time intensive classes. So Ago Pessimist, cool name, um, says great video, uh, questions about Anki. I definitely see the appeal of taking in screenshots um, and turning them to Anki cards but for, personally for me it's difficult at times to memorize everything in a slide. As an add-on, do you think it's okay to try to use the image inclusion uh, when making Anki cards? Um, do you think this is a good idea? So let's first talk about the image inclusion part of Anki. It's a really cool kind of technique that you can use for things like anatomy where there's a lot of structures and basically you can create a rectangle um, or shape over all the structures that you want to identify. Um, and then you basically do it once and then Anki makes, you know, 10 flashcards from it if there's 10 different things. So they're really effective for things like identifications or small kind of nitpicks of information. Uh, I don't use it as much, maybe I should. Um, but going to your first question, you're finding it difficult to memorize everything in the slide. Um, and I get that question a lot. Like, how do I know what's important as well as how do I get through all of the material in the slide, especially if I'm taking screenshots and quizzing myself on the slide. The first kind of approach of this is every time I see a slide, uh, my first kind of assessment is one, how much time am I gonna give to each slide? Usually I say 10 seconds. I may not seem like enough to get through the entire slide and it's not supposed to. Instead, it's designed for me to say, 
In 10 seconds, I need to tell myself, can I answer this question? And then I give myself another 10 seconds to look at the slide and pick up on what I got right, what I got wrong, as well as what I still don't know. And ideally then see that flashcard in another minute or 10 minutes. Doing the 10 second approach makes sure that you see a flashcard multiple times instead of spending an excess amount of time at one chunk trying to learn everything and later learning that you didn't actually know it. So now that you want to understand that you need a timer, and again, there's a bunch of Anki videos I'll link down below in case you're interested on how to do this well. Once you get that timer, the next time I see a, uh, a flashcard, my real question is, how do I want to approach this? And basically, I want to ask myself, the next time I see this flashcard, what are the main things that I want to learn and try to memorize by the next time I see it? So if there is a flashcard, for example, that has three major bullet points and then many bullet points underneath, underneath each of them, then I may just say, oh, you're gonna have to memorize all of the three major bullet points by the next time you see it. And that's all you wanna focus on. And then the next time I see that flashcard, one, I wanna quiz myself, do I remember those three main bullet points? If I don't, then I'm not gonna focus on learning anything else. I'm just gonna focus on picking that up. And then once I'm able to pick up those three bullet points in this example, then I may say, okay, now you need to memorize the three bullet points plus like the piece of details under bullet point number one. That way I'm systematically going through each flashcard with with the understanding that every time I'm doing it, I'm not trying to learn everything. Instead, I'm just trying to pick up one extra thing that is going to be my goal by the next time I see it. So let me know if that doesn't make sense. Uh, hopefully it does. It's just a very systematic way of going through the flashcards and just accepting that you won't understand everything the first, second, or even third time that you see it. But using the 10 second rule, you're expected to see that flashcard numerous times during your review. That way you can focus on one or just two tidbits um, in the screenshot itself that you can focus on. So the next question is by Delara uh, Kana Doctor. Hopefully I said this right. Uh, but the question is on one of my videos for physio um, and basically saying is doing physio review questions in your world enough to pass step one? Um, do I also need another question bank? So definitely your world is more than enough to help you do well um, on uh, step one, um, USMLE. Um, Physio is a great resource because it includes um, videos, flashcards, um, and text to kind of supplement everything that you need to do in terms of an acquisition phase. Um, and so if you're somebody who learns by just using one resource, that'd be a great kind of tool to use. Other people like to use things like first aid, um, you know, sketchy, pigmonic. Um, but as long as you kind of like the structure of physio, if you feel like you can learn um, through the resources that they give, and I'll link down below the video about kind of the way that physio is broken down. If you guys want a discount, that'll also link, be linked down below. Um, but that sounds like a perfect way of studying for step one, as long as physio works for you. So this is not a question, but it is something that I've been starting seeing in my comments more and more. And that was a video that I made way back then, um, which was about how to like stop being stressed as a pre-med in medical school. And so Yiz Lim says that this brought her to tears, really great talk, really great motivation. Um, I just wanted to use that as an aside that I really do want to get back on this channel of making videos that are really just kind of designed to not necessarily get views. Um, that's not my goal really with this channel, but really just getting you pumped up if you do ever end up finding that video. So there is a motivation playlist that you guys can check out on the MD journey um, in case you're finding yourself in a little bit of a slump, but definitely expect more videos on motivation um, and kind of wellness that will be coming out pretty shortly. Selena's question is a great video. Uh, this was about my Q&E method on how to take notes better um, and basically asking if she can recommend or if I can recommend a book or a resource to do well on your IM rotation. Um, there's a video that I have on my channel that basically talks about the main resources I use during internal medicine. Um, I also have a nice blog post that breaks down the resources that I use as well as the study schedule that I had designed um, for my USMLE and internal medicine shelf. Um, but some of the common ones that people use for internal medicine are things like uh, Step Up to Medicine, which is a very nice kind of all-inclusive um, text if you like text. Um, online Meded, it is going to be a great resource if you like videos, and then obviously your world is going to be a great resource to quiz yourself because internal medicine is just so broad. Really the best way to learn it is by quizzing yourself and identifying the patterns and little kind of nuances that happen when you have the same patient, same symptoms, but something is changed in their labs or their history that really make another differential more likely than another. So Sierra says, thank you for your input. Um, she's almost through nursing school, so congratulations if you're watching this. Um, and she decided to pursue medical school once she graduates. So awesome goal, really looking forward to, to becoming a physician alongside all of us. Um, you'll have some great experiences as well for sure. 
Um, she wanted to see some insight um, on getting a good study routine, which I totally uh, encourage, um, and out of curiosity, how long are lectures typically each day? and how long do you spend studying that material. So how long lectures tend to last in med school? It really depends on institution. Uh, it's a great question to ask when you're interviewing or when you're looking at programs to apply for. Um, typically each lecture is about an hour and uh, you tend to have, in the typical structure, you tend to have three lectures in the morning and that goes on for five days a week. So at least 15 lectures. Um, during your first few semesters, you may have some labs for things like anatomy and pathology and things of that sort. Uh, and then ideally they'll start to get kind of spaced out and then you just have your class. Um, so I just kind of imagine at least on the minimum about three hours of lecture, sometimes more. Um, and then how long do you spend studying that material? It just depends again on your study routine. Uh, when I was able to alternate to the Anki method that I kind of talk a lot about on this channel, uh, again, link down below, uh, no shame in the plug. Um, but once I've kind of got to that system, um, I definitely found that my study routine was able to go from like eight hours to five hours, not just because I was only spending time doing the things that were most effective to me. So again, it really just depends on once you find a technique that works for you, try to make it the most efficient for yourself without trying to add too many kind of wrinkles to it. And you'll find that you'll be able to spend the, the least amount of time doing the thing that's best for you. So Teresa had a question that she asked again about the Anki method and where I talk about using my 10 second method. Um, and she says, how in the world am I able to do it? Uh, again, I kind of re reflect and refer back to the answer earlier, which is every time I'm answering the question or answering a flashcard, really I'm looking for one thing that I want to learn by the next time I see it and then doing it each time. And ideally, if you just focus on one fact um, or one or two facts on each flashcard, you'll be able to pick them up the next time it shows up. Um, and then you can add the next systematic thing. Now I over time really focus on how can I first focus on the most high yield things. So that's usually things that have the biggest bullet points um, and then focus on the small details or how can I generalize the topic on the flashcards and then learn the details. Um, but I still give myself a 10 second to 20 second test on it. And then once I can do it, I move on and learn another or identify something next to learn. So that's kind of my approach. But again, 10 seconds doesn't have to be your approach. It can be 20 seconds or 30 seconds. Really the trick of using Anki is don't spend an excessive amount of time for each flashcard, give yourself a timer, move on, and then be okay with reviewing it because that's really where the learning happens. So Yasin asks, can I tell her the net worth of a radiologist at age 40 and how much net worth he gathers every year? I personally don't like answering questions about like net worth and money of different physicians. I just, one, it's not something that I really focus on very much. I'm sure it can vary for a lot of reasons, including how much debt you're in, you know, what training you do to get to the age of 40. Typically you imagine that a physician is as an actual doctor by the age of like 30 to 32, depending on what you do, even longer for some of my surgeon friends. Um, and then if you're making about 200,000, 250,000 or 300,000, again, so much variability where you live. Um, so net worth is hard to tell. Again, net worth is not only how much money you make, it's how much money you have and assets you have. So if you spend all of your 200,000 or 400,000 salary, your net worth is zero at the age of 40. Uh, and if you save it all, then it could be higher than somebody who makes a million dollars a year. So um, keep that in mind. So unfortunately, I can't tell you. So Medea Bath asked a great question. She says she's a fourth year medical student. Basically, she's noticing that she's starting to get a little bit kind of overwhelmed and intimidated because it seems like everyone else is more focused than her. Um, and she doesn't know where to start. Should you focus on learning new material or go back to the old things that she felt like she was lacking in? Um, some memory issues she says she has. Um, and just kind of lacking confidence. And honestly, this is something we can all relate to when we notice a classmate or a peer who just seems like they are on top of something. And then it just kind of kind of lights a fire under us, but also causes some anxiety. Should we learn new things? Should we focus on old things? My advice here would definitely be one, making sure you have a good kind of review process for all the new things you're about to learn uh, without over stressing yourself on. So if you're doing a cardiology block, instead of saying, oh crap, like I need to learn all my old cardiology, which you definitely do. Um, the first kind of step is how can I make sure that all the new cardiology I learn sticks with me? And that goes with all rotations, all the topics that you learn. Um, and in terms of reviewing the old things, maybe just have a very kind of casual way of reviewing the old materials. So if you're doing practice questions or if you're 
um, kind of have a list of topics, which is I personally love to do uh, clinical kind of topics that I just don't feel comfortable with anymore. And I try to do one every few days or once a week. Um, again, there's no time frame. I'm just kind of looking to check that box of saying, okay, today I understand um, the coagulation cascade, which I haven't reviewed since med school a little bit better, or I understand antibiotic choices a little bit better. So just remember that while everyone may seem like they're ahead, people can do a very good job of faking confidence, but to truly raise your confidence, you just want to one, have an approach of doing better in the future. So tinkering with your study system, but also having a very low stress way of checking out the old boxes of things that you just want to get better at and just casually and gradually getting through it. And eventually, if you're able to can be consistent of doing this, you'll find that other people will be looking at you as the overconfident and person that they inspire to be. So use this as a motivation, not a discouragement, and just kind of tinker with your setting system and you'll be there in no time. And then finally, a question from Opelia247, what needs to change to make medical school and residency less stressful? Uh, man, I could make a total video about things that I would want different, and especially in a medical school training. Uh, one, I don't think medical school should be four years the way it is here in the United States. I honestly don't think those four years made me four years better or closer to a great doctor. In fact, I felt like they made me initially like a good test taker, and then they forced me to say, oh, why don't you understand all your clinical knowledge by now? Um, and that made no sense. If anything, I would um, put medical students into clinical rotations and in a clinical setting um, as quickly as possible. And maybe you could just have one medical student who's designed to follow one patient uh, for a whole week um, while the rest of the residents and other medical students are really taking care of more patients. You start to just learn the lingo and the nuances of medicine much quicker than you would probably sitting in a chair listening to a lecture tell you about the genetic variants of things like cystic fibrosis. The best way to learn about that is actually taking care of somebody with the disease itself. Um, so that would definitely make it less stressful of just being uncomfortable by the very start and the quicker you could be uncomfortable in medicine, the quicker you develop confidence. And same thing for residency, I think um, for residencies can really differ depending on the specialty and the program. Um, but. If your residency isn't focused on resident wellness, that includes, you know, uh, being thoughtful for vacations, things for how much time you work consistently, um, avoiding getting close to that work hour restriction that we now have in the U.S. or no, obviously not going over it. Um, those are all the things that I would definitely want. But that medical school one, um, I think you can make medical school a lot less stressful. It definitely helps that step one is pass fail for the U.S. kind of graduates. So it definitely makes it more stressful for the international graduates. Um, but that's a whole nother video aside. And was uh, MMD just says, we support you. Please continue. Hearts to you, bud. But with that being said, guys, I will conclude this Q&A video. Hopefully you guys have found uh, it kind of entertaining. Um, definitely add your comments and other questions down below. And I'll keep making more just like this in the future. As always, make sure you show your like and support by hitting that like and subscribe button down below um, or listening to on the podcast. Definitely hit that subscribe button and drop your honest review on iTunes. But as always, thank you so much for making it to the very end of the video. I appreciate your support. Hopefully I've been a little help to you on your journey. Thank you as always for being a part of mine. I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.